Cultural Roots and Collective Identity in a Libertarian Society, an essay by Gary Chartier, posted on his blog, liberalaw.blogspot.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A law.blogspot.com, on Wednesday, October 6, 2010. In general, a libertarian society would be hospitable to people's cultural roots and collective identities. Placing one's life story in the context of a larger, more inclusive narrative can help to give one a sense of meaning and direction. Some of the tales we tell for this purpose are religious, some metaphysical, some scientific, some ethnic, some cultural. Political libertarianism would not deprive anyone of the sense of identity conferred by any of these stories, unless, of course, it could only be preserved by force, and would doubtless contribute to the flourishing of a significant number. Cultural libertarianism might undermine some of these stories, but would certainly leave many undisturbed. Varieties of Libertarianism Political libertarianism opposes aggression, the initiation of force, by individuals, including those acting under the color of law. Cultural libertarianism seeks peacefully to undermine hierarchies in workplaces and other social institutions, to promote individual freedom of self-development, self-definition, and self-expression, and to foster an ethos of openness, dialogue, and critical reflection on social norms. Proponents of cultural libertarianism argue plausibly that their position emerges from the same respect for the value of freedom that underlies political libertarianism, that people who are not consistently skeptical about positional authority will find it difficult to sustain a free society, that the assumptions that ground some cultural arrangements are inconsistent with those embraced by political libertarianism, and that aggression frequently makes possible the maintenance of hierarchical social arrangements, even if those arrangements are not themselves aggressive. Political Libertarianism and Collective Identity Political libertarianism would leave people free to form whatever nonviolent social arrangements they might like, and to remember and celebrate whatever narrative sources of cultural identity they might opt to embrace. Do you claim the story of the Israelites following Moses through the wilderness as your own? Are the Cluniac monks your spiritual ancestors? Do you see the Boxer rebels as your forebears? Political libertarianism leaves you free to identify with them, to celebrate what you judge to be their accomplishments, to treat them as central to your own heritage. Creating space for identity. Indeed, it is important to emphasize that your ability to preserve and share a cultural identity you cherish would be greater in a politically libertarian society than it is in societies dominated by states. By taxing people, states claim resources their subjects could have used to preserve identity-constitutive places, objects, and traditions. But the state poses more serious problems for those who want to nourish particular cultural identities. The state's haphazard identity-preserving projects are funded in part by taxes paid by members of minority cultures, who may have little interest in preserving the artifacts or lifeways on which the state focuses the resources it has acquired. In addition, even putatively liberal states frequently suppress or relocate cultural minorities, and state-owned media and schools can operate to erase regional dialects and other signs of subcultural distinctiveness. At the same time, because governments overseeing increasingly diverse societies frequently wish to treat all cultural groups inclusively, state-funded cultural projects tend often to be instances of characterless pagulum, with little or no capacity to contribute to the transmission of any particular cultural identity. Further, when the state claims the authority to safeguard a majority culture, it almost unavoidably also claims a hegemonic role as interpreter of that culture, often distorting or reconstructing it in perverse ways, or co-opting its values and symbols as sources of legitimation. The existence of state-owned property and employment by state agencies creates endless opportunities for conflict over cultural matters in status societies. Which religious symbols may be displayed on public land? Will officially led prayers be permitted in state schools? Which holidays will be officially recognized? Which culturally significant dress codes will teachers, soldiers, judges, or nurses be allowed to follow? Different interest groups with the ability to influence the state can engage in repeated contests over such matters, each seeking to ensure that the state works to preserve particular identity markers. The end result is that cultural, religious, and ethnic communities come into conflict with each other, and that pressure to avoid any expression of distinctiveness increases.
The problem is only exacerbated when the state opts to use force not only to manage affairs on property it claims for itself, but also to constrain people's freedom with respect to admittedly private property in the interests of preserving or suppressing particular cultural identities. The French government's bans on the public wearing of the burqa and on the wearing of the hijab in state schools are obvious examples. They prevent people from using their own property in relation to their own bodies. So are efforts in New York and elsewhere in the United States to use the state's claim power to regulate land use to prevent the construction of religious structures. In stated societies, people's peaceable attempts to express their identities and nourish their traditions can be opposed by actual or threatened state violence. In a politically libertarian society, by contrast, members of varying cultural groups would obviously be free to spend their money as they choose. They would not be required to subsidize others' cultural preferences. They could erect monuments and houses of worship, put iconic images on display, at their own discretion on their own property. They could invest in efforts designed to preserve objects and practices and memories they cherished. They could operate schools that transmitted their beliefs and habits. Obviously, conflicts over the proper uses of places and things with multiple cultural meanings will not go away in a politically libertarian society. However, by removing these conflicts from the realms of politics, by assigning responsibility for the contested sites or objects to particular people or organizations in accordance with outcome-independent rules, a libertarian society can in some ways localize their intensity, reducing the likelihood of spillover clashes and render them more manageable. Aggression and Culture In a politically libertarian society, people would be free to retain cultural roots and collective identities, and unlikely to confront many of the conflicts over cultural issues that the state unavoidably creates. Such a society would thus not only be free from state-related tensions that often prompt the suppression of cultural particularity, but also provide more room for cultural expression than a status society. At the same time, however, it would not and could not make room for any and all practices designed, even in good faith, to preserve deeply valued cultural mores. For a society that genuinely embodied political libertarianism would be one in which a norm precluding aggression was rightly understood as a necessary prerequisite to social peace and to both individual and cultural flourishing. In such a society, the claim that a given practice somehow supported the preservation of this or that group identity would obviously be insufficient to justify the practice if it involved aggressive attacks on persons or their justly claimed property. To take obvious examples, Clitoridectomy, infibulation, and foot binding could not be regarded simply as expressions of particular cultural preferences, to be treated with the same deference as habits of dress and efforts directed at the preservation of historically significant monuments. As instances of aggressive force, they would clearly fall beyond the pale in a politically libertarian society. Side note. I prescind from those cases in which those who would otherwise clearly qualify as the victims of these aggressive acts indisputably render free and informed consent to them. Cultural libertarianism surely embodies a commitment to discouraging such consent and the beliefs and attitudes underlying it. So too would the use of physical force to exclude people from trading relationships, prevent people of the purportedly wrong sort of living in particular neighborhoods, or keep people from destroying or altering their own property in ways likely to eliminate or distort objects of cultural significance. Some kinds of collective identities might not survive if those who valued them could not use force to preserve them. To this, the advocate of a libertarian society will have no reasonable choice but to say, so be it. A politically libertarian society would leave room for many cultures and collective identities to flourish, but it would obviously not be equally welcome to all. Only those which people were prepared to own without the threat of force would survive and thrive. Of course, this would remove one means of preserving and transmitting collective identities. At the same time, however, it would ensure that those who shared those identities did so voluntarily and were thus more personally invested in them, and so more likely to preserve and transmit them, than might be the case in a society in which they were preserved by force. The Limits of Libertarian Culture while a politically libertarian society would nourish diverse collective identities, a society that was also culturally libertarian might be friendly to fewer such identities. Individuality and Identity Cultural libertarianism is fundamentally individualistic, so it might